Okay, this homeostatic diagram describes the homeostatic mechanisms that keep pure water in balance. As with any homeostatic mechanism, we've got to talk about a few important things, the main important parts. We've got to name the names of too low of pure water, too high of pure water. What are the causes of too much pure water, causes of too little pure water? What are the effects of too low and too high? And then what are the methods the body uses to ameliorate this, to bring this back into homeostasis? Start again with why this is important, just really briefly. Too little or too much water will affect ion balances. Thus, the pure water issue will lead to an issue with sodium, potassium, and calcium. Before going into more detail about that, let's define too low and too high. When pure water is too low, it's called dehydration. When pure water is too high, it's called overhydration or water intoxication. Causes of dehydration would be sweating or diarrhea. In both cases, the water that's lost is less concentrated than the extracellular fluid, and so the extracellular fluid becomes more concentrated. The only real cause of overhydration is drinking too much water. This would be rare, in fact, because the signal for thirst wanes or goes away soon after small amounts of water are consumed. And animals have just an unusual ability to drink just the right amount of water, so it really takes effort to drink more water than one should. The effects of dehydration can more appropriately be viewed by looking at the homeostatic diagrams provided for hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypercalcemia. So there's movies of all of these available on YouTube as well. And that's the better place to go to see the effects of dehydration. Because with too little pure water, these ions are going to become concentrated, along with the consequences associated with that. So I don't have all the consequences here. So you'd want to go look at those videos to see the many consequences of hypernatremia, hyperkalemia, and hypercalcemia. As with alterations in isotonic fluid, the consequences of pure water imbalances are significant. And that's evident by the number of mechanisms used to counter these imbalances. For the most part, the mechanisms of pure water balance are going to be identical to those of isotonic fluid. Now, as we go through them, we'll pick out some that are going to be a little more stronger for pure water than isotonic fluid because we're going to want to focus on the reuptake of water and not necessarily ions. But because we need to balance water and sodium all the time, make sure we don't get too much sodium, these mechanisms might still be active. For example, aldosterone might still be active because there might be an increase in pressure that's going to still signal the JG cells. So as we go through this, we're going to leave all these mechanisms in, although we are going to focus on some that are going to be more critical to correcting the problem, which is too low of pure water, and we don't want to raise sodium concentration. Whereas that is what we do, we'd raise sodium concentration if we wanted to correct isotonic fluid. The first of many mechanisms is aldosterone. And here again, the JG cells are going to sense a decrease in pressure. Now that's going to make renin be released. And that's going to actually increase aldosterone, which is going to try and increase sodium absorption. Now that's not really an issue, but it's going to happen if we have a decrease in blood pressure because of dehydration. The sympathetic nervous system can constrict the afferent arterial. And that's going to decrease filtration. That's going to make sure that we don't lose more fluid. Hypothalamic thirst is going to be a good one. It's going to be a primary one because it's going to sense an increase in osmolarity or a decrease in plasma concentration. What it's going to do is cause you to drink more water, and that's going to get our pure water back up. Another consequence of too little water is we're not going to filter as much. And that means less filtrate is going to be excreted, and that's going to help us retain water so we don't have this dehydration too long. Another primary mechanism, again, is going to be the hypothalamus, which is going to signal the posterior pituitary to release ADH. And ADH is going to cause pure water reuptake. So there's going to be some balance between ADH and aldosterone. And ideally, the ADH will be stronger, so you'll reabsorb more water than salts. Another one is if you decrease blood pressure in the atria, this is going to be a weak one, then we decrease atrionatriatic protein. That means we're going to release inhibition of angiotensin II which could increase sodium reuptake. But again, that's not our major issue because we have plenty of sodium. We already have hypernatremia. But it's going to be a natural consequence of having too low of fluid, too low of blood pressure, if you're actually that dehydrated. The next thing we'll do is we'll move up to overhydration. We have some mechanisms technically, but they're all very, very weak. When we looked at mechanisms to deal with dehydration, our most strongest mechanisms were hypothalamic thirst and the posterior hypothalamus. Because what our problem is, is hypernatremia, and we really just want water back. So hypothalamic thirst and the posterior hypothalamus are going to be really, really geared towards that. In the case of pure water, what we really, really want to do is decrease pure water. But there's not a really a mechanism to increase salt concentration. There's a slight salt appetite, but not really a good one. 
So none of these mechanisms are really particularly great at getting rid of pure fluid other than maybe glomerular filtration. Aldosterone technically is going to sense an increased pressure and decrease renin, decrease aldosterone, and that's going to decrease sodium absorption, but that's not really our issue. We already have hyponatremia. The sympathetic nervous system technically wants to sense sodium concentration, so that's not going to be real accurate, but it might dilate the afferent arterial and decrease systemic vessel tone. That's going to increase GFR to help us get rid of this fluid. Increased glomerular filtration rate is going to work because if there's too much extra fluid, there's going to be more filtrate formed and excreted. That's going to help us get rid of that fluid, and hopefully the kidneys then, specifically the distal convoluted tubule, will still retain the sodium while, while losing the water. In the case of the atrionatriuretic protein, again, this is not a good one because the BP might be up and the atria is going to sense that stretch. But the way ANP works is it inhibits angiotensin II, causes secretion of sodium. This is not really what we want because we already have hyponatremia. So again, looking at all these mechanisms, we don't have a really good way of getting rid of pure water, of regulating pure water. Or at least we don't understand it because, as I said before, for some reason, animals are very good at drinking to decrease osmolarity, but we hardly ever drink too much because our mouth senses the wetness and our stomach senses the water, and we stop drinking. So the main way to control pure water is to prevent dehydration with hypothalamic thirst and the posterior hypothalamus, and we should not ever get to overhydration, so there aren't very strong mechanisms up here. That's it for homeostasis of pure water.